The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, just when you think it can't get any more bizarre, the king of pop is a no-show. Then he appears in his pajama bottoms to face his accuser. I'm James Curtis, and this is a special one-hour edition of our exclusive coverage of the Michael Jackson trial. Day 9, Michael Jackson is MIA, and Judge Rodney Melville was none too happy about it. Here's what happened according to the courtroom transcripts. I noticed the defendant's not present. Yes, Your Honor, Mr. Jackson is at no, the... No, they can't hear you. Speak into the microphone, please. Mr. Jackson is at Cottage Hospital in Santa Inez with a serious back problem. Uh, my understanding is he's on his way in. The doctor does want to talk to you on the phone. That, that's the last information I have. I did give... I, I had the doctor on my cell phone. I did give it to your clerk and tried to make contact with you, but I, uh, I know that they're waiting, hoping to speak to you about it. My understanding is that he does plan to come in. I'm going to issue a warrant for his arrest. I'm forfeiting his bail. Your Honor, it's... And I'm going to hold that order for one hour, and one hour, I'm going to execute that order. Court's in recess. <coughs> Oh, I've heard those words before. I got to think that the judge was probably a little more intense than what you just heard. But nonetheless, two minutes past the deadline, the defendant walked in, very labored walking, wearing pajama bottoms and a jacket. Later in the day, that same judge would rescind the arrest warrant. We got a lot to say about that. But when court resumed, the teenage accuser was back on the stand. The prosecutor's questions immediately created a scene of intimacy with Mr. Jackson. Now, that portion of the video that shows you sitting on the couch with Mr. Jackson, there's a point in time where you place your head on his shoulder and hold hands with Mr. Jackson. Yes. Do you recall that part of it? Yes. How did that come about? I don't know. We were just sitting there. Well, the holding hands part, that was one of the things that Michael told me to do, but I put my head on his shoulder. Why did you do that? Because, I don't know, it was like he was... I was really close to Michael, and he was like my best friend, so I just put my head on his shoulder. Now, when you heard it on the news about the documentary, did you at some point have a telephone conversation with the defendant, Mr. Jackson? Yes, he called me. All right. Tell us about the conversation. He told me. Where were you when you got the call? I was in the house, in, in my house, when the first time I moved in with my stepfather, and then he called and wanted me to go to Miami because of all the stuff that was going on. And he said that he wanted to hold a press conference, and he wanted me to be with him. With him? During the pe press conference. What else did he say? He said that he wanted me to go over there, and he said that, that like, we were talking about what was going on, and I was saying, uh, like, it's not right with what they're saying, and stuff like that. During the time of your conversation with Mr. Jackson, did the subject of the rest of your family coming to Miami come up during the conversation? Yes. Would you tell us about it? At first I asked him if my brother can come, and then he was like, yeah. And then I asked him if my sister could come, and then he was like, uh, mm, okay. And then I asked if my mom could come, but he, he kind of got angry a little bit about my mom coming. And then, but I told him, I can't come without my mom. My mom probably won't let me. And he was like, okay, and my mom came. Yeah, that means we'll probably hear from that mother. I want you to keep in mind that the actor hired for the reenactments playing the accuser resembles no, uh, makes no, bears no resemblance to the actual accuser. But let's jump right in here. The big news yesterday everywhere was the fact that Michael Jackson was yet again late. Okay, okay, okay. One. You know what? He is frail. He's under a lot of stress, and I don't think he's faking it. The problem is because he's missed some court appearances and been late in the past. Absolutely. Everybody thinks, which is the, the scenario for this whole case, the negative. Absolutely. Well, it is the negative, though. And let's assume he did hurt his back. I have no reason to doubt that. The reality is that the jurors, first of all, are delayed. Then they're told that they're not supposed to take any inference about his being late and looking what he looks like. This was a disaster because what it can say to anyone or all of those jurors is he can't face his accuser. And doesn't, isn't that exactly what it says, Sean? Well, I don't know that you that's can't take what... take it. I, 
I'm not sure that that's what it says, but he looked terrible. And what concerns me is what the jurors are thinking. He looks terrible on the day that he has to face his accuser. I don't know what significance they're attaching, if any, to the fact that he was late, what they know about it, what is filtered down well, to them from the news. What possible significance could there be well, other so than a no, someone? Here's what it's going to come down to. I, I don't agree with either Ricky or Sean. It may not look great. He's clearly sick. He's dressed in pajamas. What it's going to come down to is, what do they think about this young man? Now he's on direct. Let's wait till cross-examination. And I think jurors have a tendency well, to overlook the cross-examination. Cross -examination. But it doesn't come down to what this young man is going to testify to. This is, again, yet another pink elephant in the room, isn't it? He's yes. late. And, and he's and stressed out. Race. And, and the momentum, I think, was lost for a moment. Things were going very well for the yeah. defense. And then suddenly, Michael Jackson's missing. It all changes. Mesero looks nervous and scared. And the momentum is lost. And hopefully, it can be recaptured well, I don't know if on cross-examination. I <laughs> scared, but certainly. Well, I don't that's know. Right the jurors didn't see that anyway. And, and the idea that certainly uh, Mesro, with his experience, had the sense that he was ahead in the count, if you will, in terms of the dynamic of this trial, and now has that momentum been lost? Well, momentum now moves to the district attorney, at least with respect to his questioning and focus on the events inside Jackson's Miami hotel suite. All right. Tell us what you saw Mr. Jackson do. Michael gave me a Diet Coke can. Did he tell you what was in the can? Yeah, he told me that it was... Objection leading. Overruled. You may answer yes or no. Mike, just... Did he tell you yes or no? Did he tell you what was in the can? Yes. All right. What did he tell you? He told me if I ever heard of Jesus juice. And then what did you say? And I said I didn't know really what it was. And did he say anything after that? Yeah, he told me... You know how, like, Jesus drank wine? And I was like, yeah. And then he told me, well, we call it Jesus juice. And then he said that to drink it. And I took a little sip and I told Objection him... Objection calls for a narrative. Non-responsive. Move to strike. Strike after where he starts to say, I took a little sip. That's stricken. After Mr. Jackson handed you the can and he told you that it was Jesus juice, what did you do? I drank a little bit of it, and I told him it, that it tasted ugly. And what did he say? He said that it's okay because it, it will relax you, and he told me that he knows that I'm all stressed out because of all the media stuff that's going on, and that the Jesus juice will relax me. Now, during a... Do you recall how long you'd been in Mr. Jackson's suite at the time that he provided the alcohol to you? I was in there for a while, like it was after the second meeting with him in the other room, the improv thing. And from the time that Mr. Jackson gave you the can for the first time and you tasted it, how many times do you think you drank out of that can? Well, we went, well, just uh, after he... First of all, I'll... First of all, uh, just how many times that you estimate? Oh, I probably drank maybe... I don't think I drank the whole can, but I probably drank like three-fourths of it or something. Was the can ever refilled? I don't think it... I'm not sure if it was refilled... I don't think it was. Had you ever had wine before? Well, in church, but that's about it. Wine in church. Ricky, it's dripping, if you will, and excuse the pun, with this predatory indicator, if you will, using God, the church, Jesus, to try to get this little boy. This is very unpleasant testimony. Yeah. There is no doubt about it. And what it comes from is this setting the stage, according to the prosecution, that if he wasn't wooing him before the Bashir documentary, that after the Bashir documentary, he wants him in his camp. And whether it's a seduction for him to say the right thing on a rebuttal documentary or whether it's a more predatory suggestion, well, it's not good. It, it, if you believe it, and you mentioned Big Martin the other day, James, and I've, I've compared this case to that, and this could be something that this boy's making up in the same way that McMartin, they came out with these outlandish stories that everybody believed, and it turned out it was all untrue. And what happens, though, be... what the stewardess is with the flight attendants? If yes. you have flight attendants saying that this happened, then we know that at least this segment is right. true. And the right. proof will be in the cross-examination now. We're going to talk about that in a little while, but 
I'm still scratching my head about these dates, Howard. Again, as Ricky just alluded to, we've got the Bashir documentary that happens on the 9th of February. The rebuttal documentary is shot on the, 20, or the 19th of February, some 10 days later. The allegations of molestation do not arise until the 20th, well after. No, it, it doesn't make sense. Fertile ground for cross-examination, which I'm sure Mr. Mesro will get into. I'm still confused about pouring the wine in the pop can. What do you mean? Was there soda in the can? Was there only wine in the can? Did the kid drink in church wine mixed with Diet Coke? I don't, you know. Well, you know, another thing that, that raises is the issue that came up yesterday with respect to the taste that the brother testified to. I think it was rubbing alcohol, rubbing alcohol. and we looked sort of askew at that and were scratching our heads. But given the testimony from today, there was some hard liquor served right. as well. So could it really have been some yeah, hard alcohol? It could have been. Which would have been uh, I, I've never had vodka, but uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> vodka, I think, we'll does we can do a about little that more like show. rubbing alcohol <laughs> than wine. Yeah, we're going to see what right. uh, happens with that and how that plays out. All of these issues and more when we come back and the Jesus juice apparently overfloweth on the return to Neverland. Stay with us. Reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. Jackson's accuser tells about a flight back from Miami and refers to what has to be one of the most famous soda cans in history. Here's what the jurors heard according to the courtroom transcripts. During the course of the flight from Miami, did you ever drink any alcohol? Yes. Now, who provided that alcohol to you? Michael. And can you tell us in what, uh, what it was provided to you in? I think it was another Coke can or Diet Coke can. And what kind of alcohol was it? I think it was white wine again. And where, uh, did you see where Mr. Jackson got the can from? From the little place where they keep all the sodas in the plane. Now when, where were you when you physically drank out of the container, the can? I was next to Michael. And did Mr. Jackson say anything to you when he gave you the can? Yeah, he told me it was more Jesus juice. And he said that on the plane that he told me about how he used to get scared about planes and he said that if I was scared and to drink the Jesus juice because it will relax me. How much do you think you drank while you were on the plane? I think I drank the whole can. Was the can ever refilled? Yes. Do you know how many times? No. Were you always drinking out of the same can as Mr. Jackson? Yes. And apparently while mom's on the plane, <laughs> Well, next, symbols of a personal bond or elements of a seduction. What did he give you? As we were taking off, well, in the hotel, he also gave me a jacket. But when we were taking off on the plane, he showed me a watch. And then he had it on, and he told, he gave me the watch as we were taking off. Did he say why he gave you the watch? He said not to tell anybody about the Jesus juice, and he said that this is like a symbol that will be friends forever, or something like that, and then he gave me the watch. Did you have his jacket and his watch? Yes. During the course of the flight, were you awake the entire time? No, I don't think so. I think I fell asleep once. And when you got to Neverland Ranch, where did you spend the night? I'm pretty sure we spent the night in Michael's room. You say we, who is we? Me and my brother. Do you remember if anything happened that particular night? When we got there, me and my brother ran straight to the carts because we wanted to ride the carts, drive the car carts around. But then we went to Michael's room and we slept there and we all slept in bed, the bed together. In whose bed? Michael's. All right, Howard Weitzman, a whole can, well, we don't know how much was in the can, but he says he consumed whatever was in the can, the entire contents. The most of famous wine sort of can I know. Gift. The most famous soda can I know is the Pepsi can with Yoda on it. So I'm not sure that I agree with you. <laughs> Point I, taken. I, I but what about this issue, though? What about this issue? Let's deal with this issue, though, with respect to uh, this alcohol consumption. Presumably, we heard for the previous testimony, he insisted his mom goes. So mom's on the plane, along with some other folks, including his brothers and sisters. You know, I've consumed a bit of wine in my time, even when I was a little bit younger. Shouldn't his mom been able to have tell, been able to tell that he had been drinking? 
Well, not only should his mom been able to have told he was drinking, when he gives this testimony, it sounds like not only that he drank the whole thing, yeah. but what happens is it keeps being refilled. Or the boy of his size, who was also had a history of ill health, exactly. he would have been passed out, I would think. It's a think? perfect example of the embellishment I talked about yesterday, which you were a bit surprised that kids do that. But this is a perfect I'm not surprised. Perfect what example. I'm saying is that certainly... I the, the mistake that I don't want to make or I don't want to get into is this whole assumption that kids simply lie. And that, that's what the, that's the problem that I had with yesterday. But just they, to clarify. Even if not malicious, that kids often exaggerate for the sake of just making it bigger. And this is a piece of testimony that doesn't ring true with this image of this soda can keep being refilled, kid keeps drinking. It just doesn't have the ring of truth. Now, are there any other internal consistencies, as we might say, with this testimony? You're picking up any other problems in Inherent, and we haven't got to the portion of the molestation description yet, but uh, so far, how's he doing? Just on its face. Well, I, to me, I think it's clear he's beginning to expand the story. He and his brother in the bed. He and his brother wanted to run and get the, and play in the carts. By the way, consistent with the cross-examination of the brother that these kids have a tendency to get out there on their own. Yes, and we're going to get some more admissions from this very witness along that same line. But right now, the accuser takes us back to the never ending party at Neverland. During the time after you got to the ranch, when the limousine took you from the airport to Neverland Valley Ranch till the time you left with Jesus, did you ever have any more alcohol? Yes. On how many occasions? Every night that Michael was there. All right. Do you remember where you drank? We would, like, in the arcade, because that's where the wine cellar was. Well, it's kind of like a wine cellar. You say we. Who's we? Me, my brother, Michael mainly. And how did you get into the wine cellar? Michael would take us there. Next, the prosecution's questions become, if the Jesus juice flowed so freely, was Michael Jackson actually putting this young cancer victim at risk? Did you ever tell Mr. Jackson that you only had one kidney? Yes. And did you ever tell Mr. Jackson anything about alcohol in your kidney? Objection. Leading. Sustained. Did you ever have a conversation with Mr. Jackson about your kidneys? Yes. Kidney. Kidney, yeah. Sorry. What did you tell him? I told him that it was bad for me to drink alcohol, and he said it's okay, that it's fine, that nothing's going to happen. Now, this is tough stuff, Ricky Kleeman. You can't really get away with, no matter what quantity everyone decides, and when I say everyone, this jury decides to agree upon, if indeed they find that alcohol was given to a kid with one kidney, that's bad. It's bad if it was given to a kid with two kidneys. This is a young child. Yeah. The added fact that this is a child who has one kidney who could be at grave risk makes Michael Jackson not only appear to be a predator from the prosecution side yeah. of the story, it makes him almost to be a bit monstrous. Yeah, and and what, I, what I was going to say, it doesn't mean that he's a child molester, but it makes him a bad guy. Yeah. It makes the jury look at him in well, a way that's very negative. But you can't really split that here, can you, Howard? Because the child molestation, whether the alcohol consumption or giving the alcohol to the minor, is not just that misdemeanor that we know about contributing to the delinquency in California. It's connected to James, the child abuse in this the James, child molestation. When I listen to this testimony, for me, I think about cross-examination. I'm wondering exactly which doctor said to this young child at 10, listen, by the way, don't drink too much because you only have one kidney. Well, what's your point? My point is he's been coached, in my opinion. I don't believe a doctor would say to this young man at 10 years old, you know, if you drink, be very careful because you have one kidney so and you, alcohol what, could damage I, I'm, you. I'm, I'm still not clear. What, what, do not, you, what do you mean with respect to this testimony that he wouldn't have the there sensibility? No There's no doctor. He wouldn't have ever said I want to have one kidney. He would so. not have told Michael Jackson on his own I shouldn't drink alcohol. I only have one kidney. Where did that idea come from? Because Some doctor tells him saying that, that to, a, to a youngster. A doctor might right. say that to an adult. Look, you're not allowed to have alcohol. You're not allowed to have ABC, XYZ foods. All right. But he's not going to say that to a child. He doesn't assume a child is uh, you know, drinking liquor out of a Coke can. Mm, good point. Good point. We'll see how that plays in this courtroom. And when we return, the bedroom alarms are ringing in the accuser's head. It's spinning. Stay with us. Yeah. 
The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. Jackson's accuser continues with his memories of Neverland, including a rather odd story about a strange game of dialing and drinking. Here's how it happened, according to the courtroom transcripts. And in connection with making these calls, was there anything that, uh, do you know what it means when the call doesn't go through, you don't get somebody? Yes. What happened when you did that? Oh, this happened once. We had this big, like, it was a bottle of wine. It was like this, that big. And we made up this game. If you make a phone call and like, we would dial random numbers, and if it rang and nobody picked up, you have to take a big gulp of wine. Because we didn't really like how it tasted, so we made up that game. So what? We didn't really like how it tasted, and so we made that game up so we would have a drink, a gulp of wine, if the call didn't go through. Did anybody have to drink because the call didn't go through that night? Yeah. You have that look on your face like it was you. Yeah, it was me. Yeah. Security is tied around Michael Jackson's bedroom, unless, according to this witness, the accuser, you're very close to the king of pop. Now, during the time that you were at Neverland Valley Ranch, you've told us that you were in Mr. Jackson's bedroom and in his bed, correct? Yes. Now, how do you get into Mr. Jackson's bedroom? You walk through these big double doors and then and then you walk to the other door, and then you punch in a code, and then there are two other double doors. The little lock goes off, and then you can open the door, and then, and that's his room. Now, are there any, does anything go off when you get to a certain point yes. uh, that you're walking down the hallway? Yes. What is it that goes off? Well, when you go in the first door, it goes like this, a little ringing sound goes off. And then when you punch in the code, another, it goes off again. Can you hear from the outside of uh, when it goes off? Yes. Can you tell us what it sounds like? Dee-doo, dee-doo, sounds like that. And do you recall how many times it goes? <laughs> I'm not going to imitate you. How many times it does that? I'm not sure. I think it was like, maybe like three times. Now, where did you get the code to get into Mr. Jackson's bedroom or into his bedroom suite? Michael. Pardon? Michael. Was there more than one code to get in there? Yeah, I think so, because the nurse, I mean, not the nurse, the maid lady would punch in a different code than I, the one I knew. So did you get another set of codes from somebody? Oh, from, for the other, well... There's another door to the main house that I knew a code for. You did or did not? Did. All right. Where did you get that information from? Either it was Michael that gave it to me or the maids gave it to me because they change it sometimes. All right, Howard, you're the resident expert on the actual structure and the layout of the Michael Jackson residence. How's this testimony ringing with you? Well, I missed the part when he said he, he went up the stairs to get to the room. I guess he and the brothers maybe entered the bedroom differently, or their stories aren't consistent. Well, but he's not telling me, no, come on, let's be fair. He's I not am talking fair. about going up to the room. He's talking about once you're there and the code you put in. Come on. Yes. The brother didn't put in any codes, I right. noticed. So uh, I, I think, again, to me, it shows some inconsistencies. I can't tell if he's being truthful or not. Uh, after cross-examination, I yeah, guess. Yeah, we'll know, we'll know a little right. bit more, yeah. but Sean, Sean, you don't want, and I'm going to try to make you play prosecutor. I know you hate it. Actually, I know you really like it, but the idea here, if you're the prosecutor, you have to be able to explain to this jury, and they would expect. You don't want your witnesses testifying like cookie-cutter uh, sheets or something like that. You want them to be a little different, and that is an indication of truthfulness. Well, 
Tom Snedden knows that there are all these codes and keypads and alarm systems. And so when this boy is telling Tom Snedden the story initially, Tom Snedden has to ask him, well, how did you get in there on all these occasions with the security system? So if we believe that this boy is unbelievable, he has to come up with some story as to how he had access. Michael gave him the code. He saw the maid or the nurse. All right, the what code. about if we believe, Ricky, that this kid is believable? Well, I think that all of this gets solved with something I mentioned uh, yesterday, which is the fact that I think this jury needs to take a view. Yeah. And I think they need to take a view and be told that the condition of the house and the security system is the same as it was at this time. And they need to go look at all these code places and they need to hear the alarm and then they can get a picture. When we listen to this, we're not getting a clear picture, so we have no basis to know who's telling the truth and who isn't. You know, yeah. the, the, the defense has asked the judge, and I'm sure he'll yes. grant the request to take the jury out to never have the, the prosecution to want and the judge to take this. We've also requested the media in general that we get the pictures that are being displayed to this jury, and as soon as we do, you will too. Next, did the parting at Neverland jump to another level? Now, do you remember, you told us that some of the times that you drank vodka with Mr. Jackson, correct? Yes. Do you ever remember a situation? Of, what effect did the vodka have on you? Well, there was this one time, well, vodka really tasted... You're going to have to lean into that and talk so we can hear you. I don't really understand what your... What effect did the vodka have on you? What did it make me feel like? Yeah. Well, there was one time where... Well, the first time that Michael introduced me to vodka, he had like a glass about that big. Objection. Calls for a narrative. Non-responsive. It's non-responsive. All right. Did Mr. Jackson provide vodka to you? Yes. And how did he, uh, and what did he provide it to you in? In a glass about that big. So you're indicating maybe two or three inches? I guess. I don't know. And what kind of a glass? Um, where were you when he provided it to you? I was in the wine cellar. And did you see him pour the vodka into it? No. Did you know what it was when you first sipped it? No. How was it that you ended up drinking that particular glass? I walked down there because I asked where Michael was. Well, we were in the arcade, and that's what we usually kind of did. And then so I went down to the wine cellar, and I saw Michael there, and then Michael had the glass poured, and then I asked him what that was, and he said, drink it. And then he said, like, objection. All right. Non-responsive. What did he say to you? He told me to drink... Just a moment. There is an objection pending or just a narrative? Narrative, Your Honor. Go ahead with your next question. What did he say to you? He told me to drink the vodka. And did you do that? Yes, but I didn't know it was vodka. I thought it was water because it's, like, clear. Okay. So I drank it really fast, like, if it was wa water, and then I didn't really... <laughs> When I brought it to my nose, it smelled like rubbing alcohol, and then I chucked it back really quick, and it started burning. Well, I, like, took down the whole thing, but it really burned, and then, like, two or three seconds later, my head started, like, it looked like the room was spinning, so I put my head inside the couch. You know the green couch that I was talking about? I put my head inside it so I couldn't see the room spinning, because it was kind of hurting. All right, here we go with the alcohol, the taste of rubbing alcohol, and actual alcohol. What, one of the things that's interesting about this to me is in a high-profile case, like in the O.J. Simpson case, the jurors and the viewing public feel like yeah. they know the defendant. And the same is true with Michael Jackson. Ow. We have to ask ourselves, is Michael Jackson the type of person, as we know him, who would give vodka to a small child, who would say, don't tell anyone, even if they put a gun to your head? It just doesn't jibe with yeah, what we think of Michael Jackson. The problem that I have, though, Ricky, is, you know, this is molester speak. If indeed Michael Jackson is good for this crime, don't tell has got to be the refrain that every child molester has ever said to every victim. Well, I, I don't know if everyone has, but certainly most of them have. And certainly we know that a lot of the reasons that kids don't tell have to do with fear, fear of harm to themselves, fear of harm to their family, uh, fear of not being believed. It goes on and on. So it may be true that he said, don't tell. I don't know if he said, don't tell or I'll put a gun to your right. head. Um, but there, the reality is you must tell the child not to tell. However, here, it's don't tell that I gave you wine. 
It's not don't tell I didn't touch you. Don't tell I did. Mm, yeah, don't tell yeah. that I gave you wine. So this is why I'm giving you a seventy-five thousand dollar watch and a jacket. This is my bribe to you. Just don't tell your mother or anybody else that I got you drunk. And that really gets into how, with the idea of the inconsistency of the dates, this count one, given that that's where the child abduction, false imprisonment, and extortion come in, and it's a little askew with the molestation counts. Well, I don't know if it's just a little bit. You mean in terms of timing? Yeah, yes, timing. But, but but I get back to the picture that this young man is attempting to paint here, which is Michael Jackson alone in the wine cellar, pouring vodka, looks up, the young man comes in and it's drink this potion. And it seemed to me to be very orchestrated and... Um, orchestrated, what do you mean? Like as in coached? Or as, 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 as in coached, whether it's by the, the prosecutor, whether by the parents, you know, the, the, the inconsistencies I think are are multiple here. One of the things that can happen though is the prosecution coming forward with corroborating evidence yeah. and what I'm saying about that is that there was a search warrant that was executed of course much later on and we know that in Michael Jackson's bedroom at least there are opened uh, bottles. One we know is wine, some other yeah. is alcohol and we do know what's in this quote unquote wine cellar. All right well when we return what should a young guest at Neverland call Michael Jackson plus testimony about Michael and a mannequin. Stay with us. The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. The accuser paints a picture of an escalating situation in Neverland. Here's how it happened according to the courtroom transcripts. Now, I want to ask you a couple more questions and then we'll move on to another subject, okay? But I want to ask you a little bit about some of the drinking that you did at the ranch. Okay. Do you know what the term passed out means? Yes. Tell the jury what that means. When you like lay down and you like go to sleep and you sleep for a long time and you sleep pretty hard. During the time that you were at the ranch and you drank alcohol with the defendant, Mr. Jackson, did you ever pass out? Maybe once or twice, but I don't think I really ever... Well, when I'd go to sleep, I would usually sleep pretty hard. But I don't know about, like, just sitting somewhere and just, yeah, you know what I mean? I guess uh, I wouldn't admit it even if I did. <laughs> Thank you. Did you ever get sick? Yeah. How did you feel when you got sick? Felt like my stomach hurt a lot. I don't think I ever really threw up, though. But, like, I felt, like, nauseated. Next, what's in a name? Apparently, D.A. Thomas Nettin thinks quite a lot. Now, in the Exhibit 347, it's signed by Mr. Jackson as Dad, and in the exhibit, he makes reference to being your daddy. Yes. Had you, uh, had Mr. Jackson ever called you, asked you, uh, uh, strike that? Had Mr. Jackson ever used the word daddy to you prior to the time he wrote this note to you? I don't know. I would call him dad sometimes because I don't really have like a set dad at the time. You know what I mean? So how long do you think it was between you and Mr. Jackson that you were calling him dad? When I was up there. Up where? After Miami, like a couple weeks after Miami, he started calling me son and I w would call him dad. So that was a fairly usual thing between the two of you? Yeah. And we have copies of those notes. Ricky Kleeman, is this bad for Michael Jackson? It might be bad. It might be good. Uh, it's very nice when someone is taking care of someone who's been sick, a young child, and creates a relationship that has a rapport. On the other side, some people may say, this is really peculiar. And, and does it go too far, Howard Weitzman, with respect to corroborating uh, some of the t testimony that the, certainly the prosecution wants to get in? Well, it, it can't go too far for the prosecution. Sure. And, and Mr. Snedden uh, needs to know that. I mean, it's hard for me to tell exactly where he's going because, in my opinion, he's got a shotgun scatter approach here. But 
if if this is real and if it happened, I don't think it's bad for well, Michael. I think it just shows what was going on. And it seems like this daddy question is hotly contested. I think it was in the opening when Mesereau said that the mother is the first one who suggested that everybody call him Daddy Michael. Yeah. So we're trying to figure out here, both sides have a different scenario of where this daddy language came from, and, where and, it originated. And it's not predatory necessarily. It really could be very sweet and could be very innocent. It all depends on how you look at it. Certainly it does, but Howard, I want to get back to the issue of shotgun approach, but, and what you meant by that, but apparently the defense isn't contesting that this is Michael's handwriting. Well, no, and, and it may well be Michael's handwriting, and it shows a close relationship. It surely doesn't show anything bad. It doesn't show anything predatory, as Ricky said. All right, so explain this, explain, before we get to that, uh, Sean, explain what you meant by shotgun approach. Shotgun well, approach a, a, as I read and I listen and I watch the testimony, to me it's not choreographed in a way that's easy to understand. It doesn't paint a great picture for me so I can follow from point A to B to C as I would like to see if I was a juror. Well, you know, you can only work with what, with what you have, Sean. I mean, if you've got witnesses that are a little scattered, a little inconsistent, I think Ricky's point the other day of a good start at the Bashir vid video, that sort of triggers everything, and then you're going through the key witnesses, the sister, the brother, and now the victim. Well, no. your job on direct examination, as you well know, is to take everyone through a story, a very methodical story that's easy to follow. We're having a hard time following it. We asked for somebody to do a timeline for us because we can't figure out what's going on. Yeah. The jurors are probably a little bit in the dark. I agree with Howard that it's not a clear picture of how this whole thing is. Let me say this. Let me say this. James Curtis would have done it differently. Yes, he would have. <laughs> Butter me up now. Now the prosecution spins some evidence, just like Howard Weitzman, maybe, before the defense can. And do you recall the questions that the social workers asked you? They asked me about Michael. And, and do you remember what you told them? Yeah. What did you tell them? I told them that he was a nice guy and that, like the stuff that we said on the rebuttal tape. Pretty much the same stuff. Yeah. Do you remember? Did they ask you whether or not you slept in a bed with Mr. Jackson? Yes. And what did you say? I said that we do now because we were over at the ranch. But I told them that nothing happens when we're on the bed. I'm sorry? I told them nothing like bad happens. Was that the truth? At the time, yes. Now, bizarre is a word that we use a lot in this trial. Unfortunately, it's got to be used again for the accuser's next testimony. Now, directing your attention to the mannequin that's in the photograph in front of you, okay? Did you ever see Mr. Jackson do anything with that mannequin? Yes. Tell us what he did. Well, me and my brother were looking at the mannequin and we started laughing at it because it was shaped funny. And then we showed Michael and he started laughing. And then he started acting like he was, like, having sex with the mannequin because it was shaped funny. I couldn't hear you. Because it was shaped funny. All right. So what did he do with the mannequin? He acted like he was humping it. And where was he when he was doing that? On the bed. Where were you and your brother? I was sitting on the bed, and I think my brother might have been standing up. What's the significance, Howard Weitzman? What's the significance? I, I have no idea what the significance is, to be honest with you, except to show that Michael maybe does odd things and strange things that have some sexual nature well, to it. Well, there's a lot of sexual nature to it if he's humping a mannequin. And I think what the prosecutor is trying to do is saying, this is all part of how Michael deals with this boy. He's dealing with the mannequin. How he he's, seduces them? He, yes. He's, you know, that they become part of this little group, that they are looking at dirty magazines or they're looking at the Internet, that they he humps the mannequin, that he talks about masturbation, that he appears naked, that it all sets the scene for him to say, it's okay to let me touch you, in essence, because it's normal. It's but natural. But I, right. I think that this testimony really helps the defense because the defense is saying that Michael is really like an adolescent in so many ways. And this is classic adolescent behavior. It doesn't seem to me to be consistent with child molestation and more with the fact that Jackson is this strange guy who has this stunted growth and is stuck in... Adolescence. Absolutely, but With doesn't it kids. get you close enough to plant the the the, the uh, rock, rock bed or bedrock, if you will, the foundation for playing that adolescent game and setting up a victim? Here is the problem with a situation like this. Sometimes truth 
sometimes fiction. You can't tell where a witness is going, and when they mix some truth with some fiction or made-up story or accusations, it's very confusing for someone to figure out what they want to believe. This in and of itself is not criminal conduct. But, 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 certainly it's not criminal conduct, certainly not nice conduct or good conduct, especially if it's not your own kids, unless you're also a 13-year-old. However, let's back up just a minute. The backdrop on this testimony is a Michael Jackson who just hours earlier had a warrant issued for his arrest. This is the testimony that in some jurors' minds that he was scared of. I don't well, think the jurors know about the warrant. They don't know about the warrant. They don't know about the warrant, but they know about the late. They, he's late, but they also see this disheveled guy exactly. coming in in pajama bottoms and slippers. They know something's right. wrong. And, and there really is, uh, sandals, excuse me, there, there really is something wrong here. And so he looks weird. I mean, he totally doesn't look like himself. And now we hear this testimony about this really peculiar behavior. Yeah, really peculiar. Ricky paints a great picture. Doesn't she, though? That's why she was a great attorney oh, when she was is in the courtroom. Is. Okay, I misspoke. Is a great attorney. Was a great trial attorney when she was trying cases. Still ahead. I'll get out of this somehow. A suitcase filled with smut. Stay with us. Final. The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. As we continue with the young accuser's testimony, it shifts from underage drinking to a more sexual incident. Here's how it happened according to the courtroom transcripts. Now, when you first saw the suitcase, where was it in that room? It was next to, it was to the left of the couch thing. And did you ever see Mr. Jackson pick up the Exhibit 470? Yeah, like I was hanging out with him in there and he was like putting out his makeup or something. I don't know. And then he... He grabbed the, grabbed the suitcase, and then he told me, he told me it was Frank's, and he showed me, he was like, okay. this is... Okay, yeah, and what did he show you? He was like, look at the, look at this stuff. Frank's stinking A-S-S. -S. Frank's stinking, it was S. Frank's stinking ass. Right. What was inside the suitcase? Adult materials. And how many did you look at with Mr. Jackson? Well, he showed me just one. Like, he showed me, and there was this girl in there, and then he put it away. And how was the girl? She had her legs spread open, and her vagina was, like, showing. All right. Did you ever see that suitcase again? Yes. Where? We had it, like, we had it up in his, near his bed, and then we were looking at all the stuff. Who was we? Me, my brother, and Michael. And do you recall where in the bedroom was the suitcase when you first saw it that time? The first time I saw it, it was in the restroom kind of thing. And then the second time we, I don't know if we brought it up there or like Michael brought it up there or something, I don't know, but it was up next to his bed and we were all going through the thing and we were making fun of Frank. Did you look at the magazines? Yes. How many magazines do you think you saw? We saw, like, practically everything, but there was a few we didn't look at. How much time do you figure you were looking at all those things? 30 minutes to an hour, probably. Did Mr. Jackson make any comments during the time, uh, other than the ones you've talked about? Uh, any other comments that he made at any of the photographs or the magazines? Not really. We just were, like, making fun of Frank. All right, final segment. Uh, Sean, who's ahead? I, I still think that the defense is, a, is ahead, and I think that Michael Jackson's weirdness helps him. You. He's probably the only 46-year-old man on the planet who we could actually imagine yeah. having an innocent point. relationship with young boys Howard, sleeping in his bed. What say you? After this testimony, Snedden talked to the young man about Michael masturbating him twice. 
and then he, he left that subject, ended the examination, and left 20 minutes for Tom Mesro to get up and begin the cross-examination, and Mesro did a good job beginning to change yeah. the atmosphere. And we're going to talk about that cross-examination when we come back. Ricky? Orchestration is really critical, and every lawyer knows that. And here you have a situation where every commentator out there said how wonderful this youngster did on the stand, how powerful he was, how appropriate he was. Mr. Snedden had enough in his arsenal to finish the day at the end of his direct when the jurors would have a three-day weekend of to full sympathy for this child. So I think for the prosecution, although I think they were ahead because of the child, they should have ended later, not sooner. And uh, Sean, the idea of ending on that note, that's a trial dynamic gamesmanship thing. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. What's that you? I can't understand why Mr. Snedden didn't take advantage of that opportunity. Now the jurors, as Howard says, gets to hear Mesereau's cross-examination. And so they spend, I guess, a three-day weekend thinking about what the last words were, which were Mesereau's words. Yeah, indeed. There, there's nothing more powerful than letting that jury go home with the two yeah. grossest acts if they're true, that Michael yeah. Jackson did to this young man. Yeah. Now, we're going to leave it right there. Don't forget our one-hour weekend edition. That's tomorrow, 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., and it's only on Ian Monday. We'll feature Mesro's cross-examination of the accuser. See ya. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, what's next? After a tardy appearance by a pajama-clad defendant amidst rumors of financial ruin, the court braces itself for yet another week of testimony. I'm James Curtis, and this is a special one-hour edition of our exclusive coverage of the Michael Jackson trial. With major distractions whirling about outside of the courtroom but away from jurors, it's kind of easy to forget that the real story is the testimony of this young teenage accuser. Here he describes rather eccentric behavior by the King of Pop, and according to the courtroom transcripts, this is how he responded to D.A. Snedden's questions. Would you take a look at that, please? Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that? It's a telephone that, like, we would listen to, like security guards talking to, like, their girlfriends and stuff. How do you know that? Michael showed me. Showed you what? How to, like... Because what you do, like when you see one of these lights flashing, it means that someone's on one of those lines. And then you push the line and you can hear them. But once you push it, you can't say anything because they can hear you. And then you push mute so they can't hear you. And then you can hear who they're talking to and what they're talking about and stuff. Now, who showed you how to do that? The first time Michael did. Now, were you present with Mr. Jackson when he listened in on people's conversations? Yes. A quick programming note here. Keep in mind that the actor hired for our reenactments bears no resemblance to the actual accuser. Next, a startling sight that shook up the young accuser. And where were you when you saw Mr. Jackson coming up the stairs? Me and my brother were laying on the bed. And what were you doing? I think we were just laying there. All right. And when Mr. Jackson came up the stairs, did you notice anything? Yeah, he was naked. When you say naked, what do you mean by that? Like that clothes on. Did Mr. Jackson do or say anything at that point in time? No, he just ran up and just got something and went back down. I'm sorry? I think he just ran up there and got something and went back downstairs. Do you recall him saying anything at that point? No. And what was your reaction to what you saw? Nothing. It was just kind of like me and my brother were kind of like, ew, you know what I mean? Kind of like what? Ew, like we never really saw grown man like naked before. Hmm. You know, when I read that the first time, it didn't strike me strange, but hearing it now, it strikes me strange. I never saw a grown man naked before, Sean. That is rather strange, and of course it corroborates... I mean, and, and let's just put some context with that. I'm talking about other adult men, you go to school, you... I don't know. Is that... Is it just me? I think it's just you. Okay. Coming from me, because... <laughs> Outside of perhaps a parent, right, but right. we're not talking about boys his own age, we're talking about an adult male coming into a room where he and his brother are naked, that that's uh, not a good thing for a little boy. Oh, right, well, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Howard Weitzman, why do we care about this phone call testimony that we heard at the beginning? Well, I, I'm not sure we care. I'm not sure it lends anything except to paint Michael in a bad light and to show he does childish things or has the ability to show childish things. But that seems like it ties in more with the defense. I think the defense theme is that he's kind of odd and adolescent. I didn't understand why Mr. Snedden would introduce this because it doesn't in, seem to in, fit into... I want to piggyback on what you're saying, Sean, too, because I think this is interesting. 
The prosecution has tried to say that Michael Jackson would eavesdrop onto the conversations of the mother and the, uh, the children, but particularly the mother, when they were falsely imprisoned, according to the prosecution, at Neverland. So they were like under surveillance. Mm -hmm. But here, Michael Jackson apparently uh, uh, eavesdrops on everybody's conversation. Right. So it cuts right. against the prosecution. Well, it may, but then it may give credence to the idea that if he eavesdrops here, he would eavesdrop elsewhere. But let's move on to another point, the second portion of the testimony that we heard about seeing Michael Jackson naked. It has a ring of truth to the extent, Howard Weitzman, that it corroborates or at least consistent is consistent with the other testimony from the other kids. Absolutely correct. On its own, it, it reads to me and sounds to me like credible evidence. He's missing the part that his brother said, which is the erection. That may but, be a different day. But or that's right. Or he could be shy, embarrassed, forgetful, or untruthful. Again, it's really hard to tell exactly if there's a, a, a motivation, if he's just forgetful, or if it is a different day. But Ricky, let's pick up on your point. If it's a different day, did Stanton do a poor job of clarifying that? Because well, the jurors of, have to be asking that question. One of my issues about looking at these transcripts uh, is the fact that I often don't know what day certain things happen on, and I think that is a problem. And I think the idea, Sean, has to be that you got to get into some detail, and I want to talk about the whole detail question or question of detail, lack thereof, later on. But what about that point that Howell and Ricky just made? Is this the same incident? Is it a different incident? Is it clear to you? Yeah. Should it have been made clearer? Well, yeah, we talked about this last week. Snedden, I don't think, is doing a very good job of taking us through a very clear chronology. We're all having confusion here, and I can only imagine the jurors are having the same sort of confusion. What's Unless, of on? course... Snedden doesn't have any clear, it doesn't have the ability to clear up ah, the dates. Maybe it's yeah. all confusing. Maybe these boys don't know the dates. Hence the wide range of dates in the charging document that we call an indictment. Well, a few minutes later, the accuser says drinking leads to fear of getting caught and some bad advice from Jackson. And how did the subject of the urine specimen come up or a urine bottle come up, uh, peeing in the bottle? I was afraid that the alcohol would show up in my urine, so I asked Michael, I told him, Michael, I think the alcohol might show in my urine. Objection. Calls for a narrative, non-responsive, move to strike. Overruled. All right. So you're talking to Mr. Jackson? Yes. Okay, and now, and you already told us that you told him about the test. Tell us the rest of the conversation, what you told Mr. Jackson. I told him that I was afraid that the alcohol was going to show up in my urine when they got the test. So I asked him, what should I do? And then he said, doo-doo, just don't take the test. He said, what? Doo-doo, just don't take the test. What do you mean, doo-doo? <laughs> well, he called a lot of kids doo-doo or doo-doo head. Did you say anything back to Mr. Jackson when he told you, just don't take the test? Well, I kind of told him I had to take the test. And he just said, don't take the test. And then after that, I just kind of nodded my head and didn't say anything. Did you do any drinking after that? Like, we were already in the wine cellar and I had my glass poured. Well, did you drink it? Yeah. Did Mr. Jackson drink? Yes. Do we have big bleaking, blinking lights, Sean Chapman Holly, of coaching, 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 I'm concerned that it'll show up in my urine. This is, of course, a Howard Weitzman question, exactly. but I figure you might want to do Well, this thank you. It dovetails exactly <laughs> into what Howard was saying last week, and that is that what a child of this age, and I can't remember how old he is at this time, but what a child 15 of right this now, age we're 13 at the time. be concerned about alcohol showing up in his urine or even know about that. It goes back to what Howard was saying last week. Well, oh, Howard, I, go ahead. I, I, I'm going to say something. This is a kid who's sick and probably having his blood tested regularly. And you could certainly make an argument that his fear of having alcohol detected has, uh, has to do with the fact that Michael's giving him alcohol and he doesn't want it detected in his blood rather than, you know, him being on probation and the probation officer finding out that, that, that he had alcohol. So, but it's uh, not a question of probation, and we know right, that. Right, you're being facetious about right, that. Right. I know that, but, they're, but someone might hear it, not so facetious. Yeah, no, no, that's why I wanted to clarify. We're, we're dealing with, you know, these urine tests here, and I think, I think Howard is right, that one of the things is that he knows, if we assume this child is truthful from Mr. Snedden's point of view, this child knows he is not supposed to be drinking. And that's a bad thing, whether it's for his health or whether his mother's going to find out he knows he's not supposed to tell. So he could have enough sense that if it comes up in a urine test that he's going to be in trouble with his mother. It if could no one else. either way. But let's talk about mom for a minute. It seems like there's an awful lot of drinking going on and mom apparently, and we haven't heard from mom yet, 
But does mom know what's going on? If, if she does, she's not apparently trying to put a stop to it. Well, she's, she's not right. in the house. I mean, she's not in Michael's bedroom. She's Let's some, put it that but, way. But she's, she's around sometime. And what about the drinking on the plane? Well, the drinking she's on the it would it'd be very interesting what she says when she testifies as if she knew or not. Obviously, according to the government, Michael didn't want her to know. That's why, according to the government, he gives the child the jacket and the watch. You know, it's like, don't tell your mother, don't tell anyone you that I'm wait, feeding wait, you this alcohol. Remember, the brother noticed how bizarrely he begins exactly. to act after right. drinking from the coke cans. He would think that the mother would notice this. You, and would some think, you would think, you would think, well, that's what we think. When we return descriptions of the alleged crime, now too much information or not enough detail, and later a fierce response by the defense. Stay with us. Reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. Next, the accusation at the heart of this trial. District Attorney Tom Stedden asked the alleged victim to take us back to the time of that crime or alleged crime. Here's how the teenager responded according to the courtroom transcripts. Now, Gavin. Yes. At any time while you were at Neverland Ranch, did Mr. Jackson ever touch you inappropriately? Yes. All right. How many times? What I saw in my memory is only twice, but I mean, there's, like, I kind of feel it was more than twice, but I mean, the only times that I saw in my mind that he did it was only twice. All right. Tell us about the first occasion. <laughs> the first time? Well... My brother stopped sleeping in our room with us. You're going to have to slow down and talk right into that mic now. I know you're nervous, but go ahead. My... My brother had stopped sleeping in our room, and... Objection, non-responsive, move to strike. Uh, I'll lay some foundation, Your Honor. Stricken. Gavin, the first time he touched you, where were you? Uh, what room? We were in his room. Where were you in his room? On the bed. Was there anybody else present besides you and, this, and Mr. Jackson? No, I, I think it was only us. Now, you told the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that on many occasions that you and your brother and Mr. Jackson shared a bed in his bedroom, correct? Yes. On this particular occasion, had your brother Starr been with you and Mr. Jackson in bed before that? for this objection leading um, that's a that's a terrible question anyhow I'll withdraw it was there a period of time where your brother star stopped sleeping with you and mr. Jackson objection yes. leading overall the answer was yes and was it before or after the time that mr. Jackson touched you for the first time when my brother stopped yeah it was before because he stopped sleeping in our room in, in the room. The accuser goes on to recount a truly disturbing story he heard from Michael Jackson. All right. Uh, tell the jury how it came about that you and Mr. Jackson were in bed together and what you were doing. Well, we were, well, we just had come back from drinking a lot in the arcade and it was... Doing what? Drinking in the arcade. Can you pull that down just a little bit? There. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> we just came back from drinking in the arcade, and then we went up to his room, and then we were sitting there for a while, and Michael started talking to me about masturbation. So you were in the room for a while, and the defendant started talking to you about masturbation? Yes. What did he say to you? He, he told me, he said that if men don't masturbate, then that they can get to a level where they can might rape a girl or they might be like kind of unstable so he was telling me that guys have to masturbate and he told me a story that objection non-responsive uh, all right uh, we'll stop right there okay what else did he say to you uh, he told me a story of he saw a boy one time he was looking over a balcony or something and he saw a boy who didn't masturbate, and he had sex with a dog. Did he tell you anything else during this conversation? That particular section? Yeah. Or... 
I mean, did he tell you anything else? He told me that boys had to masturbate, or males have to masturbate. All right, Mom, if you're watching, just turn the set down right now. Howard, you and I have to have one of those guy conversations. This story, disturbing on one hand, ridiculous and outrageous on the other hand, but doesn't it remind you of the kind of talk that kids this age just might actually have? And when I say kids this age, putting Michael Jackson back at the age of this kid around 13 years old. Boy, I never had these conversations. I find you did it... not go to my school, Howard, apparently. Well... You were... <laughs> I find the whole exchange incredible. The issue really is, which side is it incredible on? Would Michael Jackson have said this and made up this story to perhaps intimidate or coerce, coerce or seduce this kid? Or did the kid make it up? Well, I don't know. Ricky, come on. I mean, all right. Let me just give it right. for the I, benefit I can, of my, from my experience. I can say well, I, and I really don't want to get into this discussion really in, in a lot of detail more than we have to, but the idea is that Young boys have stupid conversations yes, they do. like and this. So, frankly, if kids do don't girls. masturbate, well, then they're going to, you know, I mean, well, it's... the old uh, story of if you masturbate, you'll go blind. Yes, that was that that in my era. Now this is the other side. If you don't masturbate, you're going to go out and rape a girl. I mean, both are ridiculous. Kids have these conversations. The only question is, did Michael Jackson have these conversations? If you believe the story that Michael Jackson is just an errant adolescent, you can picture him having these conversations. If he is more deviant, then these conversations become sinister to a level that's really... Absolutely. Right. You know, I'm, I'm happy to hear, though, that adolescent boys do have this kind of conversation. Last because time I checked, they did. Well, Maybe I'm out the one. provides a right. basis for Gavin to know this story. He's talked about it with his friends, not Michael Jackson, perhaps. That may be true, and so taking Oof. that one step further, is it coached speak or kids speak? Well, yeah, it, you know, it seemed to me to be coached. And I say it's kids. Okay, go ahead. Power. Well, I was a kid once, many years ago. You did have who conversations. Didn't go to my school. Who didn't, but you did have conversations. <laughs> I will concede about masturbation. This goes beyond you're that. You're talking about the, the, this the goes thing beyond. with the dog. You're talking about rape. You're talking about dogs. Those conversations I never had. But it sounds like, that, Ricky, the kind of story, whether Michael Jackson said it or not, that a kid would make up, yes. or kids would make up. Yes, and it's also a kind of story that kids would make up to justify masturbation. And whether or not that was a story planted by someone else, Michael Jackson said it, he didn't say it, well, that's yet to be or found the two out. could have made this up. Could have been two kids talking with, you, with each other. The prosecution continues seeking details that include what Michael Jackson was wearing in his bedroom. They couldn't hear what you had to say, Gavin. I know it's hard. Uh, just lean right into it. He told me that males have to masturbate. All right. Now, when he said that, what, if anything, did he do or say after that? He said that if I masturbated, and I told him that I didn't, and then he said if I didn't know how, that he would do it for me. And what did you say? And I said, I didn't really want to. All right. And then what happened? And then he said it was okay, that it was natural, and that it's natural for boys to do it. All right. What happened after that? And then so he, we were under the covers, and I had his pajamas on because he had this big thing of pajamas, and he gave me his pajamas. Okay. And so I was under his covers, and then that's when he put his hand in my pants, and then he started masturbating me. Could you see Mr. Jackson while he was doing that to you? Not really. I, I wasn't really looking at him. Could you tell whether or not he was moving? Well, he was... He, he was himself? Yes. I wasn't really looking at him. All I could... I could kind of feel him moving, but, I mean, I never really saw him moving. And next, the accuser delivers more graphic detail. Do you know approximately how long Mr. Jackson masturbated you? Maybe five minutes, I guess. Did, um, do you know what an ejaculation is? Yes. And did you have an ejaculation? Yes. Did Mr. Jackson say anything to you afterwards? I kind of felt weird. I was embarrassed about it. And then he said it was okay, that it was natural. Did anything else happen that evening between you and Mr. Jackson? No, we just, after that, we just, he tried to say that it was okay and that kind of like to comfort me because I felt weird. I felt weird about it. And then after a while, we just went to sleep. 
is this a question, Ricky Kleeman, of too much detail or not enough information? I prosecuted sexual assault and child abuse cases. I recall, and myself, as well as watching other sexual assault and child abuse prosecutors, going into excruciating detail about the particulars of the assault. You don't stop at, was there ejaculation? What did it look like? What did it feel like? Did it smell? What happened afterwards? Did you clean up? The kind of questions we heard coming out of the Kobe Bryant case, it's not here. Well, I, I don't know if it is too little detail. I think that the picture that is painted just with this overview of what happened is so grotesque if this really happened. And I think that it may be enough. I also wanted to bring up the fact that we have to remember he's talking about this cache of pajamas yeah. that Michael Jackson has and that he was wearing pajamas. They shared pajamas. And this is the day that Michael Jackson you comes took, to court in pajamas. You took the words right out of my mouth, Howard Weitzman. A bad visual. Bad. bad visual. This is what cross-examination is all about. And you started to touch on it. Now, the picture this young man paints is he's masturbated, he ejaculates, Michael says it's okay, and they go to sleep. I missed the part where you clean up afterwards. And if I was Mr. Snedden, assuming the facts were present, that's what I would have gone over in detail to give that jury the feeling of a realistic experience. Right now, as I listen to it, it isn't real. It doesn't seem that there's quite enough detail. And, Sean, I suppose the danger for the defense is the reaction that people will have initially is mass mission is as horrible, this is terrible, and not think about that level of detail. Yeah, you know, and I want to go back to one of the earlier selects when he answers, what I saw in my memory is only twice, but yes. I mean, there's, like, I kind of feel it was more than twice, the only times that I saw in my mind. You prosecuted these kind of cases. Maybe you can tell us. If this is normal, this sounds kind of bizarre to me, like perhaps there's other memories he has, not from what happened, but from what somebody told him. What well, somebody told him or... I think they're going to bring in a child abuse expert, and I think that that's the person that they expect to tie this all together, that often what happens to kids when they're victims of sexual abuse or physical abuse, but particularly sexual abuse, is that they say that they only remember some, that they say it was in a dreamlike state, that they say that they may have fallen asleep. And I think that expert is critical for the prosecution. Maybe, critical. maybe, maybe. But, Sean, if you think that that talk, that language back in my 11-year-old memory is a little odd and bizarre, there's more coming up. When we return, the voice says he resisted, and later the defense attorney goes on a rampage. Stay with us. Enactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. The teenage accuser continues to provide graphic testimony about the crime that Michael Jackson is charged with. Here, Prosecutor Tom Sneddon asks about a second incident in Jackson's bedroom. This is what the jury heard according to the courtroom transcripts. Was there any other occasion where Mr. Jackson touched you? Yeah. When was that? Well, there was about a day after that. He did it. He did it one more time. All right. Where were you? In his bed. And was it daytime or nighttime? It was nighttime. And who else was... Was there anybody else present besides you and Mr. Jackson? No. And what were you doing up in his bedroom at this point in time? Well, we just came back from the arcade again, and then we went up to his room and then we were sitting I think we were watching TV or something and then we were on top of his covers and he did it again how were you dressed on this occasion in his pajamas again because I would always use his pajamas all right and how was mr. Jackson dressed do you remember he was in his pajamas too next the teenage accuser claims he tried to say no now with the tell us what happened the same thing happened again and he said that he wanted to teach me, and then we were laying there, and then he started doing it to me, and then he kind of grabbed my hand in a way to try to do it to him, and I kind of, 
I pulled my hand away because I didn't want to do it. Did Mr. Jackson say anything before he reached over and grabbed your private parts? He would always say that it was natural and don't be scared and it was okay. Now, how long do you think it lasted the second time? The same time. Did you ejaculate the second time? I think I did. Now, when was it at point in time that Mr. Jackson reached over and grabbed your arm? Maybe like halfway through it. Did you say anything to him when you pulled your hand away? I said that I didn't want to. Did Mr. Jackson say anything to you? I don't think he did. Were there any other occasions where Mr. Jackson tried to do something to you that you felt was inappropriate that you remember? No. I have to go back, Ricky Kleeman, to not enough detail. And again, Mom turned down the television set. But if you're listening, the detail, the lack of detail, both of these incidents essentially stop at did he masturbate you? Was there pain? What did it feel like? Was there any lubrication? I mean, this is graphic, I know, and I apologize to anybody who might be offended by this, but this is what happens in a sexual assault, assault of this nature, and it's not here. I, I agree with you. I mean, I think I would have prosecuted the case as you would have with far more detail. While saying that, I'm going to defend Mr. Sedden in this way. Let's assume that Mr. Sedden believes that this is enough and he doesn't want to embarrass this child any further, and perhaps he thinks that it'll be up to the jury to fill in whatever is left. Now, the risk he takes is this, of course, is that the detail then gets done by the defense, which actually could really mess up the detail for him. It could, and Howard, let me go ahead and pitch in and help out Mr. Sedden to the extent that this graphic detail may make this kid uncomfortable, may make the jurors uncomfortable. Will it be enough, or is it simply opening a door for the defense? Well, I think it opens a door for the defense. And Mr. Snedden, in my opinion, should have been more cautious and more detailed. This is a credibility issue. And ultimately, the jurors are going to have to take this young man's word or believe Michael Jackson didn't do it. And the detail becomes crucial here in this jury assessing credibility, in my opinion. And now, Sean, what about the next question that has to be, what does this have to do with what Starr described? Starr, David, the brother of this accuser, uh, described two incidents, none of which, according to my recollection, and help me out if, I, if I'm missing something, said anything about Michael Jackson masturbating his brother. Right. As I recall, Starr said that his brother appeared to be sleeping, s slightly snoring. So I'm wondering if these are completely different occasions. We don't know, I think, in part because Mr. Snedden is not making it clear. He still has an opportunity to clear it up, I suppose. And it gets back to the point you made previously about the vague answer at the end, in my 11-year-old mind, or maybe, maybe that actually comes later, but in my memory, I remember, too, I think there might have been more. Does it... Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's you can vague, only, you can but... only do w w use what you've got. Kids oftentimes will not go into these kinds of details in sexual molestation cases. And it becomes a blur to them. They know that the act happened. There was masturbation. There was ejaculation. But to get them to remember the detail is really a task that they may not help you out with because they can't. And is that where the expert comes in? I think that is what? exactly where the expert comes in. It's incumbent, in my opinion, of to, uh, up to the lawyer. It's up to the lawyer to take these kids along that path. And Mr. Snedden hasn't done that. You can do it, assuming the facts are present. Now, can you wrap it up and tie it in a neat bow? Should the prosecutor attempt to do that? Or if he can't, should he just leave it alone? Well, the accuser's story has been compelling, at least up to this point. Now it's time for the defense to try to tear it apart. That's what he gets paid for. Tom Mesero hits back and hits back hard. Now, you told the jury yesterday that Michael Jackson didn't do much for your cancer, correct? Yes. Was that a true statement? Yeah, because I didn't see him much. He would tell me that he wasn't there when he was there at the ranch, and it made me real sad because, in my mind, he was my best friend in the whole world, and my best friend was trying to avoid me while I had cancer. Did Michael Jackson call you at the hospital while you had cancer? Yes, he called me, invited me up to the ranch. He talked to, to you a lot in the hospital, didn't he? No. Here, does it come across Sean Chapman Holly as, and this is just the beginning of this portion of the testimony, the cross-examination, 
this kid being a spoiled brat perhaps? He called me, but he didn't call me enough? Or is this the complaint of a sick kid that is going to find some sympathy? Well, as we'll see later, Mr. Mesero makes exactly your first point. That is that this is a smiled kid, a, a spoiled kid rather. And again, we have to juxtapose the way this kid was living before and the way he's living at Netherland, which is not necessarily coming through. How did he suddenly go from living in a one-room apartment with all of these people to suddenly now demanding that Mr. Jackson do more for him, pay more attention to him, call him more? I'm not sure where this is going. Um, it doesn't really look good for this kid, this sort of testimony. On the other hand, demanding. Howard Weiss, but I have to tell you, and we're going to look at some more of this cross-examination, I don't like this cross-examination. I don't like it to the extent that it seems, one, that Mesereau is being maybe a little too rough with this kid, and secondly, more importantly, and what I'm more surprised at, coming from Tom Mesereau, Ricky, you and I got to see him in action during the Blake trial, fabulous, that he seems to be all over the map and getting thrown off his game, if you will, by this young accuser. Well, there could be a reason he, he's taking this particular tack. Sometimes you don't want to be structured and linear. You want to get the, the, the witness relaxed. You don't want the witness to know where you're going. And perhaps what he's trying to do here is show that this young man makes things up and is less than credible. When he says Michael Jackson didn't call him enough, and then in cross-examination we're going to see in a minute, he actually did call him more than the first impression would lead you to believe. So that this may merely be a setting up of lack of credibility. But but, and, and you may be right about that, but the aggression, I mean, I've, I've watched him as well. I watched him for weeks in the Blake trial. And granted, this is a, an, an entirely different scenario when you're dealing with a child. I never seemed to pick up, and Ricky, help me out with this, that he ever was out of control. Never. He was always in control. And I don't, think, I don't think he's out of control here because what happens is this is like a volleyball game, if I can use that metaphor. To use Howard's word, it's the setup. What he is, is he's tossed the ball up now with his kind of generalization about, that, uh, about Michael not calling him. And now in, what we're going to see in the next part of the testimony is he jams it over the neck when he shows exactly how often Michael did call him. Now, let's look at that jamming over the net, as it were. When we return, can the accuser hold up to the full court pressure of this defense? Reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. Some testy exchanges on cross-examination as the defense seeks to draw out a different version of this relationship. Here's what happened according to the courtroom transcripts. Do you remember telling the police in your first interview you were asked the question, and did you talk to him a lot while you were in the hospital? Answer, I talked to him a lot, like he would call, and I'd call him and stuff, and we'd just talk about, like, video games. Do you remember that? Yeah, I, I probably meant lengthy conversations at, as in time. You were then asked, how often did he call you? I don't know, but I think it was probably at least three times a week or something. Do you remember that? Yeah, including outside of the hospital, my grandmother's house. But that's not what you told the sheriffs, was it? You told him that he called you approximately three times a week. Excuse me, uh, he's not even giving the witness a chance to answer the question. I thought he answered the question. You're cutting him off. I apologize. Pardon me. Let's go over it again. You told Santa Barbara sheriffs in your first interview, Mr. that Michael Jackson called you about three times a week at the hospital and you would talk for two or three hours at a time, correct? Yeah, during the, probably during the period of when, in the beginning of the first few two months of my cancer where I was actually going and hanging out with Michael. And after those two months, it was all cut off. Did you tell the Santa Barbara sheriffs that when you were in the hospital with cancer, uh -huh. Michael Jackson would call you at least three times a week and speak to you for an hour, two hours, or three hours at a time? Michael would call me during the, probably during the beginning of my cancer, probably three times a week, and I would call him and we would talk to a, a long time, and we would talk about video games, and we would talk about people he knew, people I knew, stuff like that. Well, that exchange even has Howard Weitzman shaking his head. Next, Mesro implies that no good deed goes unpunished. I'd like to explore your statement to the jury that he didn't do much to you, much for you, when you had cancer. 
Okay. You've just talked about the calls, right? Yeah. He invites your family to his home, correct? He invited us to Neverland in the beginning, yeah. He lets your family stay at his home for weeks, correct? Yeah. He gives you a car to use, true? Yes, same car he takes back in the middle of the time that I need, really needed a... that my family needed a car. Gives your family an SUV so they can go back and forth to the hospital, right? Yes. Gives you a computer, right? Yes. Flies your family to Florida and lets them stay at a resort for two nights, right? No. He took me to Florida in result of the Martin Bashir documentary that was being aired. Did your family stay at the resort hotel called Turnberry in Florida? Michael put us up in the resort in the Turnberry. All right, Howard Weitzman, I talked about you shaking your head and making audible sounds over there. Howard, what do you think of this cross? Well, I, I think the cross is very well done. I think it shows a young man who's defensive, trying to anticipate where the examiner is going and attempting to justify certain statements that he's made. It all goes to the credibility issue. And um, it, it seems to me, this young man, if I'm assessing credibility, you have to take a, t take a step back and look at him and say, gee, I wonder if he's being truthful or not. And if he lies in part here, would he tell yeah. a story you know, here? Yeah. This is a difficult, as we know, a difficult cross-examination. This is the most sympathetic profile who could exist, which could exist in a victim. Sure. He has cancer. He's poor. He's the victim of abusive parents. And so the difficulty for Mr. Mesereau is not attacking too hard, but getting at the truth. And you, you, again, you read my mind. You guys are on a roll today. Ricky Kleeman, that's what I'm picking up. Howard says you pull back and you say, is this kid being too defensive? I pull back and say, is Mesro being too aggressive? Well, we have to also remember that when this took place, this was a very short period of time for Tom Mesro to begin his cross-examination. The jury was going to have the case for three days before he continued his cross. And I think that Mr. Mesro may have gotten a bit rough with the kid too early if we looked at it if he had a whole day. But he wanted the jury to see that this boy may be lying. On the other hand, uh, what Mr. Snedden has going for him is that you have a child who was in the hospital that Michael Jackson befriends when he has cancer, right. and the child wants more. Of course he wants more. He thinks he's dying. He thinks he's dying. He thinks he, he perhaps is entitled. I don't know if that's good or bad, but Howard, what about the strategic aspect of this? Let's put aside for just a moment whether uh, Mesro was too rough or not rough enough, whether the kid was defensive or not. The point that Ricky touched on when we, before we left last week, Snedden stops this direct examination and gives Mesro the opportunity to have this jury go home for the weekend, not with the great point, if you take it on its face, made by Tom Snedden, how many times were you molested? It does two things for Tom Mesro. First, it does begin to set a stage on, on impeaching the credibility of this witness. And secondly, it allows him to start to take control of this witness. This witness goes home over the weekend and knows that he's going to be asked tough questions and he better think about the answer and be truthful. Now, that may be something that uh, will play itself out in this courtroom. We've yet to see. As the questioning continues, the tempers flare. Did you get a watch? Yes. From Mr. Jackson? Yes. Did you get a jacket from Mr. Jackson? Yes. Did your family go back and forth and stay at Neverland free? Everyone stays at Neverland for free. Well, who do you think pays the bills? Object as argumentative, Your Honor. Well, on both parts. Let's start another question and don't try to... Mr. A minute. I'm sorry. I'll instruct both the witness and the attorney not to argue with each other. You don't want that instruction if you're any attorney in a courtroom in front of a jury. A few minutes later, it's who did what for whom and how much is enough. Can you look this jury in the eye and tell them Michael Jackson did nothing for you when you had cancer? I never said Michael did nothing for me. Did you say he did very little? Yeah, he didn't do as much as I felt, as my 11-year-old mind felt. He should? No, he shouldn't. It's not his obligation to do anything. Well, are you telling the jury you deserved a lot more from Michael Jackson than you and your family got? No. Is that what you're saying? No. I'm just saying that... See, when I have a friend, Michael, and you're saying all these things that he did... But, you know, when my 11-year-old might... And when I see my friend say that he's not there and he's not at Neverland Ranch trying... And I see him walking, and I see his car that he only drives going down at Neverland. You know, it felt like my heart broke right there. So by doing all of these things... I don't... 
And I don't remember George Lopez or Jamie Masada or Luis Palenka ever doing that to me. Did they take your family into their homes, any of them? Actually, I went over to... I actually... I spent a night at Chris Tucker's house. Did he let your family move into his home, yes or no? I'm sure he probably would have if we really got to a point where we couldn't live at our house no more. Huh. I'll instruct both witnesses, Sean Chapman Holly, excuse me, both parties, the attorney and the witness, not to argue with each other. That hurts in it front of the jury. Hurts. It and, definitely and hurts. And let, let me just dovetail on that. Unlike the dressing down that Mesro got at the beginning of this trial, which I agree was probably inappropriate for the judge to do, this I think is okay. Um, Come I, on, give I, it up, Sean. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You're absolutely right. Okay. And, and judge, this is not what you would want. This is not what you would want to have happen. The jurors can't help but feel for the boy yeah. when the judge is exactly. telling the lawyer, stop arguing with him. Yeah. And, and he becomes, the boy becomes victimized by the lawyer. And here what you see is the judge protecting the boy. And one of the things that I said before I had to rethink, that it wasn't that this young boy was afraid of dying, because he says that he didn't think he was going to die. He knew he was dealing with cancer and chemotherapy. But he had overheard the doctor overheard said it was the conversation. parents, right. So here you get this child who really was vulnerable, who is becoming vulnerable again, and no wonder he's defensive. Now, do you agree with that, Howard? And the second point that, I, that we need to deal with is, yeah, he didn't do so much as I felt as my 11-year-old mind right. felt. Uh, I coaching, that, coaching. I thought that was a very odd Red statement lights. and indicates coaching. But I think what Tom Mezzo is trying to do, and I understand the strategy, he's got 20 minutes at the end of the day. He wants the jurors to go home thinking he, the lawyer, doesn't believe this witness. He kind of dismisses him with some disdain, and the witness argues with him. If you look at the last question and answer we heard where he says about Chris Tucker, did he let your family move into his home, yes or no? And the young man does not answer it, yes or no. Why doesn't he answer it, yes or no? Because he has his agenda. Well, yeah, he but has come his on, story. No, no, no. He Even is a 13-year-old witness. After all, and I think the kid actually makes a good point when he says, look, we didn't move in and perhaps Mesro tries to oversell, as it were. They don't move in. They stay there for an extended period of time, but they don't uh, pack it all up and move into the home of and, Michael Jackson. And, and you really, you almost, I'm sorry, I have to disagree a tiny bit. Oh, don't apologize uh, for that. Go ahead. You know, you almost understand the kid, um, Gavin, being somewhat defensive sure. because Mesero has really upped the ante, has got him into this argumentative state almost by virtue of Mesero's argumentative posture and attitude and stance. All right, Howard, you get to respond on the other side. So, Ed, Neverland, a paradise or a prison? Stay with us. The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. Is the young accuser able to stand up to a vigorous cross-examination by Jackson's attorney, Tom Mesero? Well, you be the judge. Here's the dramatic confrontation according to the courtroom transcripts. There isn't one celebrity that you approach to let your family move into his home except Michael Jackson. I didn't True? Think, excuse me. I'm going to object to the question. Uh, assume the fact not in evidence, and it's argumentative. Overruled. I never moved into... Michael's house. I never moved my stuff over there and lived there permanently. I stood there and visited. Your family was there for weeks at a time, correct? Yes, and they also kept us there for weeks at a time when we wanted to leave. Is this one of your many escapes where you came back? Object as argumentative, Your Honor. Sustain. I withdraw it, Your Honor. He withdraws at Howard Weitzman, and here I think, and tell me if you, you agree with me, this is really more of the same point, more of the point that he made during the last segment of his uh, cross-examination. Not only that, I, I think it is too argumentative, in my opinion. So maybe there was a strategy he had. I can't see it. You, you shouldn't be arguing with this child. Yeah, now let's move on to another point. Outside of the hearing of the jury, on Friday, the jury 
is not in court. They set that day aside for motions. Those are the requests that either side, the prosecution or the defense, makes of the court about what they want to do, the type of evidence they want to put on. There were several of them. Let's talk about one of the big ones. That is the jury view. That is the idea that the defense asks this court to allow the jury to take a field trip. Right. We want the jury to go, according to the defense, Not a to King motion. Neverland. Okay, hold on just a second. Let me just lay this out for everybody. We want the jury, the defense says, to go to Neverland to take a look at the house because it's so unique and because there's been so much discussion about what you can see from where, what, what vantage points, what you can hear. Crucial, but it was, it was crucial, shot down. crucial, crucial to allow the jury to assess the credibility and from their point of view see if the witnesses could in fact see or hear what they said they could. And Tom Mesro, I thought, did an excellent job in laying out for the judge a number of reasons. I mean, to use his words, he talks about um, view, yeah. uh, various doors, sound. And what I thought was strange, the district attorney's office never filed anything in opposition. Mr. Mesro, you can tell, thought the motion was on a Yes, exactly. Because let me hold that thought. I want to get everybody in before we have to go. Sean, he shoots it down the judge summarily. He doesn't comment, doesn't and, edit right. No, he says no. It's a videotape. It's my paranoia. They allowed a jury view in the O.J. Simpson trial, led to a not guilty. I think everything is reversed. They don't want that O.J. Simpson right. verdict. I don't know about no that, Ricky. Yeah. He says they, they, uh, the reason for not doing the view is because they have videotapes beyond videotapes. There's more videotape yeah, in this case than anything else. videotapes are by the prosecution. Catch us tomorrow at 9 p.m., another one-hour edition, exclusive Michael Jackson trial coverage. We'll see you then.